We're going to be walking through part 17 of our series, Discovering the Kingdom, which is in 1 Corinthians, but I need you to begin in a different book with me today, and that's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. If you need a Bible, there's one under the seat in front of you. It's page 984, 984. And I'm going to draw your attention to the fill in the blank on the sheet that was given to you at the front door in just a moment. Let me give you a couple thoughts. God designs in systems. He designs in a very organized way. How many of you have heard the phrase intelligent design? Anybody have heard intelligent design? Okay. So that's kind of a a Christian uh, buzzword, and, and here's what it means. It means that one of the evidences that God is real is that you look out into creation and you see intentionality. For example, one of the arguments for the existence of God is called the watchmaker analogy. And it says this, if you were walking through a field and you stumbled upon a watch, you wouldn't say, huh, what an accident. You would say, huh, whose is this and who made it? Why? Because it's so intricate. When you look out into creation, when you look out into our universe, you should never look at it and go, huh, what an accident. You would go, huh, whose is this and who made it? Because it's so brilliant and it's so organized. Well, one of the ways that God builds into his organizations is what we call role, right? There's different roles that we play. Some of us are sons, some of us are daughters, some of us are mothers, and some of us are fathers, some of us are brothers, some of us are sisters, that we have all these different roles that we play here on earth. And the heart of the message is going to say that while you're playing your role in God's great orchestration, do it honoring him and honoring the people around you. Now, one thing that's fascinating about how God creates is he reveals his nature in what he does. We take it for granted that 2,000 years later, we say a phrase like the Trinity. What is the Trinity? How does it work? I have no idea, but I can talk about it, right? We all know the Trinity, right? It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you already know that God, we believe in one God. Is that correct? Christianity is mono theistic. That means there's only one God. We don't have three gods competing. We don't have all those other issues. There is one God, but he reveals himself in three persons. And you're like, hold up. Aren't those just different hats that he wears? Well, mm, not really. Here's why. Let's consider the baptism of Jesus. You have the voice of the Father coming from heaven saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Son is in the water and down comes the Holy Spirit like a dove. Three, operating independent, but one heart, one mind, one essence. That's a trip. We don't have anything on this planet that's anything like that. So sometimes, oh, it's confusing. Well, hold on. There's a couple things that we can learn about God from that. First of all, although they are co-equal, although they are coexistent, although they are fully unified, they actually have different roles. If you want to talk about whether or not that is the role of redemption of people, the role of creation, let's take the role of creation. The Father is the initiator. He's the one that spoke the world into existence. But as he spoke, what emanated from him was called the word or logos. That was what we now know as Jesus emanating out. And the orchestrator sanctifier was the Holy Spirit. Different roles. As a matter of fact, this might kind of trip you out a little bit, but do you realize the whole phrase of father and son didn't exist for all time? It became. Why? You originally had three persons of God, and you would say that one of them sent another one. The moment he sent him to become flesh and dwell among us, which we call the incarnation, the moment he sent, he became the source sender, which made him the father. The one that went became the son. 
Before the manger, he was not known as the son. He was just the second person of the Trinity. But he stepped into a role. And the moment he stepped into the role, it changed the dynamics. Now all of a sudden, he walked through this world listening to the Father's instruction, operating off the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I'm pointing all this out is that whatever we're about to say about the family structure, whatever we're about to say about the church structure, it needs to be reflected in the Trinity. There is diversity and unity. There is diversity and equality. There is something powerful that God is creating in us in the roles we step into. And you're going to find that step by step, you're just going to kind of get blown away when you realize, wow, this is starting to become a little bit more clear. In Ephesians 3.15, it says that all families on earth derive their nature from God's nature. When you see how a father deals with a child, you see God. When you see how a wife engages with a husband, you're supposed to see God. All these roles are supposed to further share what God is like. Paul takes a snapshot of that, and we're going to read it right now. Go ahead and turn with me if you haven't, Colossians 3.18. Let's take a look at this. You've heard this before if you grew up in the church, if you're new to the Bible, welcome. Here we go. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants or slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservant slaves justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Paul, in a split second, grabs three of the most dominating social dynamics of the first century Roman world. Marriages, parents and children, slaves and masters. Notice he is not commenting on whether those roles are good roles or bad roles. Here's what he's saying. If you find yourself there, there's a way to do it right and there's a way to do it wrong. So let's talk about it. There's some roles we fall into. Nobody here chose to be a child. Like somebody else ended up making that determination. You just kind of showed up and you're a kid. That's just kind of how it works, right? Now, it's you guys' moms think it's harder than that. <laughs> it didn't just show up and have kids. They're like, it's actually difficult. <laughs> no disrespect. In some places in the world, in some places in time, marriages are arranged and forced. In other ones, they're chosen. No matter how you got into marriage, let's say you're there. Now, how do you handle it? Whether or not you chose as an indentured servant to sell yourself into slavery to have a roof over your head and three meals a day, or whether or not you were a prisoner of war and found yourself a slave, there's a way to handle it and a way not to handle it. If we handle it well, God is glorified. If we handle it poorly, he is dishonored. Yes? That's what he's trying to get down to. How do we live and operate in a Christ-honoring way? How do we receive the blessing from doing it God's way? The fill in the blank on the sheet in front of you is this. Honor comes with proper alignment. Honor comes with proper alignment. It's a way to do it and a way not to do it. Here's Paul's main concern. It is all about God. It is not primarily about us. When we play our roles rightly, we glorify him. We are not to detract, we are not to distract, we are not to steal God's glory. It's his name on the marquee. Imagine this, imagine you go to Vegas and you're gonna go see David Copperfield. I don't even know if that guy's still alive. <laughs> Let's say you're gonna go see David Copperfield and that's the name on the marquee. It would be tragic if we leave that show and we're like, dude, the assistant, wow. The way they held the little cape thingy, that was awesome. Because ultimately, the show's called David Copperfield. So why are we focusing on a side character whose name's on the marquee? 
The point is at the end of the day, we're supposed to go, wow, David Copperfield. All right, God's name is on the marquee. It would be a bummer if everybody's talking about you and not about Jesus. It'd be a bummer if everybody's talking about Pastor Lance or somebody on a podcast or somebody on a right TV show and somehow all the attention is pulled away from God and now everyone's like, who's Jesus? And you only know his followers. That's a problem. You tracking with me? We got to play our roles and do it right. You see, we've been walking through this book of 1 Corinthians, and really it's a pastor kind of engaging with a rebellious congregation, and he's been correcting him on some stuff. We just finished this whole correction on food offered to idols, right? It felt like we were always talking about that. And now he's going to shift into some other social dynamics. He's going to handle three of them as he closes out the book. Number one, there's some ladies in the congregation that were doing some dishonoring things, and he was like, hey, knock it off. You're taking the eyes off God. Number two, he says this. Hey, there's a bunch of rich people here. Whenever you come together for the Lord's Supper, you're being mean to poor people. Yeah, that doesn't honor God. Knock it off. And then the third one is he says, you guys are so lit up with the power of the Holy Spirit and you're so gifted. There's a bunch of you that speak in tongues. There's a bunch of you that are prophesying, but you guys are all so focused on yourselves. You're talking over each other and it's creating chaos. That's not how it's done. Guys, clean it up. We're only gonna handle the first one today, all right? Let's go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse two. 1 Corinthians 11, two, page 958. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. As you're turning there, I gotta give you a disclaimer. It's very rare that I come up on this stage after a week of prep and tell you the passage we're about to study is a mess and I don't know what it means. Like that's super rare, right? Like I do all kinds of hardcore study and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the best commentators and I'm, I'm doing all the research and I gotta tell you this, the more I kept going down that rabbit hole, the more I kept going in through the looking glass, it kept getting worse. Man, I was digging into like monsters of theology. I'm talking about guys like Gordon Fee. Gordon Fee is like legit, right? It doesn't, he's the guy that like helped translate the NIV and he's just this brilliant monster guy and he gets to this passage and he's like, yeah, I don't know. I was like, ah, shoot. Dude, if you don't know, I'm in trouble, right? So I'm gonna have you guys memorize a quote, right? I need you to memorize this quote because it doesn't only apply here. It applies to every church. You ready? Here's the quote. If it's a fog in the pulpit, excuse me, if it's a mist in the pulpit, it's a fog in the pew. If it's a mist in the pulpit, it's a fog in the pew. Here's what it means. If I don't know what the heck I'm talking about, you guys are doomed. That's all it meant. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? All right, so if you leave here and you're like, dang, I didn't understand that. Uh, me either. Didn't mean you're a bad Christian, it means like, what the heck? That's what it means, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to get a couple things that'll pop for us that we can apply. We're gonna try to cut things down, not stay in the weeds, but boy, is it gonna be a crazy journey. You ready to do this with me? All right, here we go. Begins in verse two. Now I commend you, Paul said, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. All right, we're already in trouble. <laughs> Why are we in trouble? Because the word for woman and wife are the same in Greek. You gotta figure it out in context. The word for man and husband are the same in Greek. You gotta figure it out from context. Does it matter? Well, let's read it a little bit different. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. You sure it says wife and husband? Because what if it says the head of every woman is a man? Does that make a difference? Uh, big difference. Yeah? We better get this thing right. Yeah? Here's the other problem. Nobody knows what head means. That is a challenge. Why? Because it can either mean source or authority. You're like, I don't understand, what's source? That is the primary way the first century always thought of head. 
When it talks about the head of families, it means who's the source, not who's the authority, who started the family. If we're going to talk about a river, we'd say, hey, where does this river start? You say the headwaters are up there about three miles. You're not saying that one part of the river has authority over another part of the river. You're trying to say, where did everything come from? So it either means source or it means authority. You're the head over me. But which one is it? Well, I don't know. Depends on context. You're supposed to figure it out. Ah, all right, let's walk through. Here we go. The head of every man is Christ. Now, this is the one where everyone's like, oh, I love this one. It's easy. Okay. Okay. Because no matter where you go with it, it always makes sense. Is it correct that mankind was created by Jesus Christ? Is that correct? It's always correct. Why? Because the Bible says that all things were created by him, for him, through him. Is that correct? All right, so we obviously know he's our source. Is he our authority? Of course he's our authority. He even says that he's the head of the church. So it was like, yep, nailed it. Problem is the second line. Yeah? Everyone agrees with the first one. How about the second one? And the head of a, what, woman is a man? Or the head of a wife is her husband? Which one is that? Does it mean that the woman Eve was originally derived out of Adam's side, like the creation account? Does it mean that all women are under the authority of all men? Does it mean that all wives are under the authority of all husbands? I mean, all those are really different. Which one is it? This is one of those passages, I believe, that it says, in one sense, this is true. In another sense, this is true. In other words, the word is both. But we have to figure out how. All right? But this is where we start jumping back to the Trinity. When God, before the manger was in existence, the role hadn't been differentiated as to how he was going to operate on earth. But when he stepped into that role, it adjusted the dynamics of how they operate. When a woman is a woman on this planet, she is not subject to all men. But when she steps into the role of wife, The dynamics adjust, and it locks into an organizational structure. And this is where everyone goes, ooh, this is, now men are more important. Hold on. You're going to find out that's actually not the case because the son was never less than the father. Anyone here comfortable saying that the second person of the Trinity is less than the father? You better not because you can't say he's God unless he's always God in every way at all times. You can't be other than God, right? So it has to be constant. And you're like, yeah, but father and son, one's older than the other. (laughs) One's bigger than the other. No, that's not true. It's talking about one was the source and one was the one that was sent. That's actually what it means. So when the role was stepped into, it still didn't change value. It still didn't adjust quality. It didn't have anything to say about worth. Nothing changed, but you functioned into an organizational structure, and now you operate within that. You're the same person of the same quality operating in a different dynamic. All right, let's keep moving forward. Verse four, Paul said, here's the main problem with y'all. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it's the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Any problems? What the heck? What does it mean about covered, uncovered heads and all that? We don't know. And when I say we don't know, is Paul arguing that a woman shouldn't have short hair because it's blurring gender lines? Is Paul arguing that she should have a piece of cloth on her hair? 
right? Are we talking about a prayer shawl? Because honestly, there's not evidence for that. Here's the weird irony. Women are supposed to be covered, men aren't, but I look back at the Jewish history and I keep seeing the men covering their heads with a kippah. The yarmulke. Man, you go over to Israel, you try to go on the Temple Mount, they give you a throwaway yarmulke. They're like, dude, hey, you gotta cover your head, bro. And I'm like, ah, you're making it worse. Because I thought the women were supposed to be covered, not the dudes. When did that start, right? So everything starts getting messy. Here's the other thing that makes it weird. So for the woman, it's translating uncover the head. We don't even know what it means. The men, it says men should not have down the head. What the heck does that mean? What do you mean have down the head? You mean is something coming down off of his head like hair? Or are we talking about something coming down off of his head like a prayer shawl? We don't even know what it means. It's like, holy cow. Now I'm gonna suggest to you that despite some scholars, I think that verse six, when it talks about, hey, if the woman's doing this, she might as well cut her hair short. I think it suggests that the problem isn't that she had short hair. Because then you would go, if she already had short hair, why should she cut her hair short? That doesn't make any sense, right? You're like, all right, it might be a, might be a cloth thingy, but we don't have any evidence. Hmm. Here's why it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because in that culture, at that time, everybody went, I know what you're talking about. In that culture, in that time, it was either disrespectful to her husband or disrespectful to God, neither of which is okay. And you're like, yeah, but what was it? I don't wanna do, we may not even be able to duplicate this in our cultural context, but let's say it was dishonoring her husband. All right, imagine this. So we have these things called wedding rings, right? And basically they say, back off, that's my man, okay? Isn't that, (laughs) right? (laughs) That's my woman, you know, that kind of thing. All right, so we wear this little piece of jewelry as a symbol and a sign. Okay, so let's say we're all in church in the first century, which were much smaller churches. They were in homes, and it was much more intimate where everyone knew each other's business, all right? Then we knew that one couple had trouble in their marriage, And we knew that the wife was new to the Lord and came out of a pagan background. And she's studying the Bible on her own. She comes across the passage that says, in heaven, there's no longer going to be marriage. We're going to be like the angels. And she's like, dude, I'm doing that right now. Freedom in Jesus. Takes off her wedding ring and she's like, woohoo, right? I didn't even like that dude in the first place. We pick up on that. She won't wear a ring, keeps talking you would go, whoa, 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 hold on. You're making your husband dishonored. Why are you doing that? It's suddenly all about you. We're getting all our attention on you. I thought we were coming to church to focus on him. What's going on? Or imagine that a guy, is he's just super creepy and he's just flirting with everybody. Not like tempting flirting. Tempting flirting is when the dude's good looking and nice. No, 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 I'm talking about creeper. You understand what I'm saying? Where you're just like, I have no temptation here. You're just freaking me out. Okay, imagine, imagine creeper dude is like hitting on everybody and you go, hey, buddy, back up. You're distracting from the Lord. You're out of line. You keep calling yourself a Christian and you're gross. Knock it off. Yeah? I don't care what the cultural context is. If you're hurting other people, dishonoring other people, and dishonoring the Lord, stop. That's the whole point. Yeah, but what does it say? I don't know. But we know what it means. But there is something interesting in the passage you might have blown right by. Let's read it again. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. Every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Let's pause. What are the activities they're doing? There's two of them. What are they? Prayer and prophecy. What do we mean by prayer? Everybody prays. What do you mean? You have to pray in a certain way? You got to have like a head covering or not a head covering when you pray? What is that all about? Man, I pray in the shower. I'm not wearing a shower cap. That's weird. (laughs) 
right? So what, what does it matter? No, 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 not just any prayer. We're talking about corporate prayer. We're talking about leading in prayer. We're talking about, hey, everybody, shut it down. Focus right here. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I want everyone to agree on what I'm talking about. I'm going to guide the congregation on what we're praying about and how we're praying about it. Who's doing that? Men and women. There would be no dishonor about a husband if it wasn't a mixed group. It's men and women in the same room in a church service. Wait, who's leading in prayer? Men and women. What's the other word? Prophesying. Prophesying has two meanings. You're either forth-telling the word from God's word, or you're foretelling the word, which means you're getting direct downloads from the Holy Spirit, from God himself, and sharing revelation. Wait, who's doing that? Men and women. In what context? Church. Okay, so hold on a second. You're telling me that God is going to course through Whenever I come up here and I share, that is ultimately prophecy of one sort. And if I'm getting downloads, remember, they didn't have the New Testament. They're still writing the New Testament. That means everything that was coming out, they had to weigh whether or not when they said, thus saith the Lord, is this new revelation? What do we do with it? It's a big deal. You're an oracle of God. So this is why it's intriguing to me that some traditions to which I will honor them This is no disrespect. But there's some traditions that say that women can't preach. And it seems odd to me because, hold up, what's more dangerous? Having a woman come up and go, here's my opinion on the passage, or a woman going, let me tell you what God says. Like, whoa, hold up. What has more authority? Thus saith the Lord or thus saith me? And I'm looking and I'm going, it's so odd that for so many years, for so many thousands of years, we've had this debate about whether or not a woman can exegete the Bible when you go, hold on, in the Bible it just said she can do prophecy. Prophecy is way heavier. So why are we so caught up in this part? Ah, That's for another message. Moving on. (laughs) The point is dishonoring. We don't dishonor. But notice this. For a man ought to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Oh, this is where it starts getting crazy, right? This is where we get all tense. All the women are like, mm, suspicious, <laughs> right? And, and here's why. Because it says man is the image and glory of God. In what way is man uniquely the image and glory of God. Does not Genesis tell us God made male and female in his image? It says it in black and white. It's super clear. I don't think Paul is arguing that men are and women aren't. I think he's arguing since men are, there's a responsibility to do things a certain way. Image means looks like. Glory means reflects well upon. So man, Adam, was once nothing but dirt. Is that correct? Garden of Eden, oh, look, some dirt. Scoop, 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 form, form, form. Oh, look, I got a dude, right? That's how God made Adam. All right, great. So he was made in the image of God, and he was God's glory peace. What does that mean? It means the whole reason of the existence of mankind, the whole reason Adam was put on this planet was to bring glory to the Father. That's the goal. He was a key to unlocking glory, but there was a problem. Anybody remember what the problem was? It is not good for man to be alone. Huh. So he's all by himself. Something's not right. The box won't open. Something needs to click for the box of glory to fully open. What do we need? We need a helper. Boom, out of his side is formed a woman, and God and man glory. Oh, now we're ready to unlock glory. That's how Man is the image and glory of God. 
And woman is the glory of man. Why? She was the unlock key. That's powerful, right? Hmm. None of the language that is used implies subordination, hierarchy. Nothing says the woman only exists for the man, right? Because isn't that where our minds go? We hear this woman was created for man. We're going to talk about that. And everyone's like, see, I knew it. Women are secretaries and trophy wives. Man has something important to do. Somebody's got to get his coffee. Can't take his own notes. Right? I mean, that's where we, all of a sudden you get all this weird, like, abusive stuff that starts coming out of there. Paul's like, yeah, we're not playing that game. Watch how he lays this out. Look in verse 8. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That's why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. That's a weird part. We'll hold that aside. Verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. All right, let's pause. You're like, oh, that's scary. No, it's not. It's practical. Let's go back. Man was not made from woman, woman from man. Anybody have a trouble with that? No. There was nobody, and a dude got formed. So you can't say that Adam was made to unlock Eve. That doesn't make any sense. She's not even there yet. She was created to unlock mankind's potential the other direction. So woman was made for man and from man. Yeah? All right, we got this. But what's interesting is that once we shifted from source and started talking about purpose, woman was made for man. Everyone starts putting value judgments on it. Oh, no, no, no. The man's more important. Stop. What did the Bible say? It's not good the way things are. You need a helper. You guys know what helper means? Helper is used 19 times in the Bible. Two times it's used of Eve. The other majority times it's used of God. He is my shield and my helper. Hold up, you think that implies subordination? You think that implies hierarchy? He is God. Just because he stepped into the role of helper did not change his power. It meant he locked into an organizational structure and he's the same God he always was. Just because you have a need, just because you need help and he is your helper doesn't make him Santa's little helper. You understand what I'm talking about? So in other words, God is still God in all of his fullness, but he can step into an organizational structure and say, in order for you to be better, you need a helper. I'm your helper. I'm unlocking so anything that we talk about how woman was created for man and the unlocking, that has nothing to do with value. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty thankful that God is my helper because I can't do it without him. Gentlemen, make sure that there is always a humility in you. Yeah? You can't do it without your sisters or they wouldn't be here. Then it says this. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. What did he just say? He said, guys, in case you start going down some weird hierarchical road and you get into some weird value judgments, let me be very clear with you. Woman is not independent of man. Man is not independent of woman. You guys need each other. You're what's called interdependent. Women, you will never do what you need to do without men involved. Men, you're never gonna do what you need to do without women involved when it comes to God stuff. There's a fusion there. And then he said, listen, if we wanna talk about how I balance the scales, I get it. Eve came out of the side of man and everyone's like, ooh, that makes her less important. And he said, isn't it interesting that every man that has ever been born since comes out of a woman? It's almost like he balanced the scales on purpose. 
Are you telling me any dude on this planet didn't come from out of a woman? Come on, of course he did. And God goes, that's my point. My point was, yes, I started one direction and then I recycled and said, you guys need each other. It is called diversity and unity. You're not the same, but you're necessary. That's so important. And then he said this, by the way, all things are from God. The minute you start making it about you and my rights and I don't like my role and I don't like this and I don't like, stop, your name's not on the marquee. God's name's on the marquee. What are we talking about? And then what was interesting is he throws in the super weird one. Verse 10, that is why a wife ought to have a noting of power on her head. What the heck does that mean? Nobody knows. Because of the angels. What does that mean? Nobody knows. There's a bunch of guesses, and I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to give you my opinion. You're like, well, that's not very fair. Well, you preach then. <laughs> right? You came to Bridgeway. Right? That's your problem. Okay. So here's my guess. My guess is out of the, all the options, the one that makes the most sense is that the Bible seems to indicate that when we come together as the body of Christ and we are here to glorify the king, angels are like, hey, what are you doing? They're like, we glorify the king too. You want to do it together? And so all of a sudden, we're here worshiping. God, you are good. God, you are good. And the angels are like, I love doing this. They zoom in. And they're like, go, let's go, let's go. Come on, I love this song. Wow, you're off key. I love this song. This is sweet, right? And the angels are all pumped up, and they're in the spirit lifting up glory to God. When you see all of us ministering to one another, giving a hug, having a sharing ear, praying for one another, the angels are like, dude, that's my job. Like, literally, I'm a minister. I want to go hang out with you. I want to go do that. You have angels in our midst. But when the angels show up, and they see everybody being mean to each other and judgmental, pompous and arrogant, not singing because the king is glorious, but singing because they like the song on the radio. When they start just focusing on themselves, the angels will, whoop, they come in and they're like, hold up, wait, I'm sorry, what are we doing here? This is like a conflict. I'm not sure how I feel about what's going on. Like, I'm gonna keep promoting the king, but I don't know what you're doing. There's an offense. I think that we need to remember, remember that when we are dishonoring, the supernatural world takes note. That's not awesome. Yeah? He, and this is how Paul lands the plane, verse 13. This is where he gets practical, and he's about to do a mic drop. Judge for yourselves, meaning it's obvious. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Of course not. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? That if a woman has long hair, it's for her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone's inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. I'm out. What the heck? I don't even know what you said. Dude, you can't do a mic drop if I don't know what you're talking about. What was his whole point? He starts going into this whole hair thing again. Ah, it's dishonoring. You can clearly tell by nature that a man wearing long hair. Now, y'all understand I used to have long hair. Man, I am going to argue this passage all day long, right? <laughs> I wore long hair for years, right? And you go, here's the reason why it doesn't make any sense to me. Because long hair is not only all over the Middle East, it's all over the Bible. Samson had long hair on purpose. Paul grew his hair long and then shaved it off for a vow, do you realize how many Middle Eastern men have long hair wrapped in their turban? It's covering and it looks like their hair is short. It's not. It's actually really long. So what does this whole nature tells you? And then it says something like nature gives women long hair as their covering. What does that mean? Literally no one knows. And you're like, so what do we do with it? Oh, there's a simple application. God has built so many things into nature to help us remain honoring and healthy. And when you start bucking the system because you want to be rebellious, there's a problem. Here's his whole point. Guys, I built so many things into your system. This whole business about the sleep cycle, I built that into you. 
You guys need sleep. When you keep going, yeah, I'm a workaholic, I'm a workaholic, I'm a workaholic, and you keep blowing past your sleep cycle, you're going to hurt yourself. All I'm telling you is if you are like, well, I got my own agenda, I'm going to do this, when even nature is pushing back on you, you should be able to recognize you're stepping out of bounds somewhere. I gave you the ability to process anger, but if you're not processing your anger and all you do is stew on it and let it eat you alive on the inside, shouldn't nature tell you that's killing you? But no, you're all about your own agenda, right? I'm gonna do my own thing. Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm me. God's only an opinion. He's like, whoa, 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 stop. Listen, there are certain things that are just obvious. You don't do that because you're dishonoring the Lord and you're dishonoring your people. So stop, right? Let me wrap by getting super practical. I'm gonna give you four things on which we can pull from this passage. Um, But I do wanna say this. When I was talking about women in leadership, some of you were like, oh, I don't remember that teaching. I don't remember, okay, It's called the Faith and Culture Series. We've done a bunch of them, right? We did one on supernatural. We did one on ethnic tensions. We did one on LGBTQ. We did one on women in ministry. If you want to know more about that, on our website, you would look up Faith and Culture Women in Ministry Series. I do a super deep dive, a four, it's it's an hour and a half, four hour and a half sessions. You can't get much more thick than that, right? If you want to go down that rabbit hole with me, we got plenty of that stuff for you. But I want to close by just getting super practical. What do we learn from what we just read? Because it sounded complicated, but I think it's pretty simple. If you take notes, write these down. Number one, it's not about us and our agenda. It's not about us and our agenda. You do not get to use this church for your own personal agenda. As a matter of fact, I'm going to suggest to you, you don't get to use your own life for your own personal agenda. You are a Christian. I do not get to use this pulpit for my personal agenda. If I ever do that, I'm out of line and God will have to correct me. You understand? I take that really seriously. Whose name's on the marquee? The Lord. Number two, write this down. Lead well, but follow better. Lead well, but follow better. In every business context, it's how do I be a great leader? How do I be a great leader? Listen, there's only one ultimate leader and he's God. If you're not him, you need to learn to follow well before you can lead well, right? There's a bunch of us, I would suggest our whole nation needs a big dose of humility. We are mouthing off a lot. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Who's in charge here? It's not the government, right? We need to realize that we are followers first. That is our first role, the follower of Jesus. When you step in that role, There needs to be a humility. There needs to be a yes, sir. Then you can start building your house, okay? Number three, your role doesn't dictate your value. Your role doesn't dictate your value. We are so caught up in determining if a role is important or not not, based on how famous it makes you and whether or not it has immediate power. You guys, these are the wrong way to look at roles. Why? Because you're missing how God builds. He does not build from the top down. He builds from the bottom up. God didn't want the better looking, taller King Saul. He wanted the smaller, good hearted King David. It was not Caesars that spread Christianity throughout the world. It was poor, slave, oppressed Christians. That's how God builds. He does grassroots movement. So don't ever compare your role to someone else because you don't know what's powerful in God's eyes. I kid you not, we're gonna end up in heaven and realize the true game changers never were in a magazine. That it's the quietness. It's the ones where God said, I'm giving you a measure of power to utilize. You are now an intercessor. You are now a healer. You are now an encourager. And you go, well, that doesn't sound fancy. I'm not on a podcast. Who cares about a podcast? Think about how God works, amen? Amen. 
everything he has asked you to do is important. That means that there is power in the smallest things because he is the conductor. He knows when a flute that is not as powerful as a drum, he knows when a flute's supposed to play. And if you're a flautist, that's your job because there is a beauty you are bringing to the tune that the drummer can't do. Stop saying your job isn't important. If it wasn't important, you wouldn't be here, right? Pick it up, number four. While we play our roles, honor people. While we play our roles, honor people. You guys, we are greater together. The whole business of it's me against you or it's, we have three enemies, y'all. World, flesh, devil. None of them are our neighbor. None of them are the people sitting next to you. It is us against those three. I need you to survive. And you need me to survive. When we fight, he wins. And I just don't want that. I truly believe that the only one that knows what to do is God. That means that we just have to continually say, Lord, what do you have for me today? And if somebody is out of line, it's all right to pray and say, Lord, look what they're doing. And he's like, hold up, I got it. Stay in your lane, I'll go take care of it. Yeah, but God, you're not beating them up fast enough. <laughs> hold on, I know what I'm doing. Because they had the same prayer about you. Diversity means difference. Unity means oneness. You don't need to be like me and I don't need to be like you. As a matter of fact, it's pretty awesome that we're not the same. But boy, we're all necessary. Let's close in prayer. Can I have the prayer team come on up here? Heavenly Father, you know. Nor do you know what to do. You know how to change things. You know how to advance your kingdom. You know how to transform. You know how to heal. You know how to fix. Lord, you raise up nations, you tear down nations. You set up leaders and tear down leaders. God, you're the glorious one. Jesus, you're the name that is above every name. The King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we don't wanna steal from your glory. Your name's on the marquee. At the end of this show, I sure hope you look better. But God, I know that sometimes we get a little bit self-focused. And I know that it dampens your glory. I just pray that you would give us a greater vision, something bigger than we're living into right now. That our world wouldn't be small. That our world would be running with our God into the wind, doing extraordinary things that you let us partner with you in, doing our little tiny parts so that the whole is powerful. God, would you give us a vision from your eyes and your heart? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.